All right, good evening, everyone. And thank you for joining us for tonight's webinar on kidney stones. My name is Alexis Denny, and I work in the research and education department here at the PKD Foundation. I will be with you throughout the evening, so if you have any trouble, you can send me a message via your chat box or email me at PKD Cure, at education at pkdcure.org. Trying to advance my slide here. All right. Um, I do want to let you know that there is a thunderstorm moving through Kansas City. Um, so there's a slight possibility that you might hear thunder in the background while I'm talking. Um, or the power could go out completely. And if that happens, you'll just see your screen go blank. And if that happens, I will do my best to reboot and get going just as quickly as I can. But if I can't or if the power doesn't come back on, we will go ahead and record the end of the webinar at a later date with the um, with the panelists, and then we'll post that to our website. So if you do hear a little thunder in the background, I apologize. Um, we are live tweeting throughout this event this evening, so be sure to follow us at, uh, at, at PKD Foundation, and you can tweet your questions using the stone, hashtag stones and PKD, using the hashtag stones and PKD <laughs> um, and our media social media person Sarah Bristow will make sure we know that those questions are coming through and we will add them to the list to get answered at the end um, we would like to thank you for submitting questions about tonight's topic ahead of time those of you who did appreciate your interest and we will do our best to answer as many as we can um, please note that some questions may be combined or be asked in a more general format or we may not get to all of them, and so we'll work to get as many questions answered as possible. Um, also know that the PKD Foundation does not offer medical advice, and the information shared this evening is not intended to be a substitute for consultations with your healthcare professional. Care and treatment decisions related to your health must be made in consultation with your health professional team. Um, and we're recording this webinar and we'll archive it on our website within the next few days. So if you miss it or have to leave early, you can always pop in later and view the rest of it. Um, our panel of speakers tonight comes, for, comes to us from the University of Chicago Department of Medicine. And so now I'd like to introduce um, our panel. First up, we have Dr. Arlene Chapman. She's the Professor of Medicine and Chief of Nephrology at the University of Chicago Department of Medicine. Uh, she is a renowned nephrologist and has dedicated herself to improving the lives of patients with renal disease. Her career has focused on hereditary renal diseases, specifically autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease, as well as other rare conditions, including autosomal recessive kidney diseases. Thanks for being here tonight, Dr. Chapman. Next up, we have Dr. Bahrathi Reddy. She is an assistant professor of medicine at the University of Chicago. Um, she's also a clinical nephrologist with a particular interest in ADPKD. Uh, she is involved in establishing the Polycystic Kidney Disease Center of Excellence at the University of Chicago and is the primary investigator for a number of ongoing clinical trials in ADPKD. And finally, we have Dr. Anna Zisman, um, an assistant professor of medicine and clinical director of the Kidney Stone Prevention Program at the University of Chicago. Her work is focused on understanding the mechanisms of kidney stone formation in a variety of disease states with the goal of preventing kidney stones in all kidney stone sufferers. Dr. Zisman oversees a very busy kidney stone clinic at the University of Chicago and is involved in multiple research studies aimed at improving the lives of patients with kidney disease. Welcome to our panel and at this point I will stop talking and let Dr. Chapman get us going. Um, well, good evening, and we're all very um, excited to be here with you tonight. And uh, I think we can't hear you, so if you could unmute yourself. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Hello? 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 There you go. We got it. Okay. 
Well, uh, good evening, and uh, thank you so much for having us from the University of Chicago to be with you tonight. Um, uh, we're going to be uh, sharing with you our uh, background and knowledge about a uh, complication that's very common in ADPKD and obviously associates with a lot of difficulty and morbidity and um, reduction in quality of life for, for those of you who have ADPKD. So I'm going to give you a very brief background about ADPKD and where kidney stones fit in as a kidney complication. Uh, and then Dr. Reddy is going to share with you um, the way that patients with ADPKD and kidney stones typically present. And then Dr. Zisman is going to finish with sharing how uh, stones can form uh, in the urinary tract and what can be done to help either prevent or take care of those stones that do appear with a focus on ADPKD. So with the first slide showing, uh, and many of you know this, but just for background for the general, uh, the, the group that's on the phone, uh, ADPKD is uh, the fourth most common cause of renal failure in this country. It happens uh, with equal frequency in all races and in men and women. We know that there are probably over 3 million individuals uh, worldwide who are affected with ADPKD even if all of them are not yet diagnosed with it. And even though the name for PKD comes from polycystic kidney disease, cysts are uh, common in many different organs, including the liver, pancreas, spleen, and even in the fluid surrounding the brain. And you can see from this picture, if you are looking at a computer screen, that cysts are discrete sacs. They develop in a nephron, and there are a million nephrons in the kidney, um, and they grow to a certain size and then separate from their nephron or tubule and continue as an isolated sac. And part of this distortion and growth of cysts is what contributes to the mechanical forces that can lead to uh, stone formation. So if we go to the next slide. The information that's shown on this slide comes from uh, a large observational cohort of patients uh, called the CRISP study. Some of you on uh, the webinar may be from the CRISP study, and uh, so this is information that had been collected over the first eight years of participation in the CRISP study. And it was really looking at the complications that are specific to the kidney in ADPKD. And these are the most common kidney complications aside from pain. And if you look at these two graphs, they're providing the same information. Uh, and we're going to focus on the left-hand side. And what it shows is the individuals in CRISP as they developed any of these complications. So you can see with the dotted red line, the complication that's the most commonly found in this group of complications is high blood pressure. It may not start the earliest, but by the time patients are 40 years of age, the majority of patients will have high blood pressure. Then if you see the solid red line, you can see that uh, infections in the kidney, and this can be both in the bladder and in the kidney, uh, are the next most common kidney problem and followed by the presence of blood in the urine that you would be able to see. So this would be called gross hematuria. Sometimes blood in the urine can be detected at the doctor's office with a dipstick, which is not the same as seeing blood in the urine yourself. So this is where a patient can actually report seeing blood in their urine. And the least most common kidney problem are actually kidney stones. However, they still are more common in PKD patients than in patients without a kidney problem and occur in approximately 25% of all patients with ADPKD. So if we go to the next slide, please. And this is a cartoon of what happens to kidneys uh, the inpatients who have inherited a mutation in either the PKD1 or PKD2 gene. And this first image shows how the 
kidneys can become larger, develop more cysts, and really the, the, the healthy tissue, what we call parenchyma, begin to disappear until someone reaches close to 55 to 60 years of age where they start to approach kidney failure. And if you click again, the bottom of the slide will show up. And all during this time, there are a number of different clinical complications that we take care of as physicians for our patients or patients can experience without actually going for medical help. And you can see here that the kidney stones are shown in a light blue color, a bar at the bottom, and they happen intermittently. And they do happen less commonly than the other complications that I described earlier. For example, they happen less commonly than pain, they happen less commonly than urinary tract infections, or cyst infections, or blood in the urine, or when a cyst ruptures. We go to the next slide, please. And when we see patients with uh, pain, we are never, we're not sure initially until we do a thorough history, talk to the patient, evaluate them, and oftentimes we need to have uh, some type of radiological test done that helps us determine what the cause of their pain is. Um, and these three patients give you an idea of the types of things we look for on imaging to tell us whether or not someone's pain is coming from either a cyst infection, kidney stones or nephrolithiasis, or bleeding into uh, a cyst or cyst hemorrhage. And if you look at the picture on the right, on the upper right hand side, you can see that the kidney is being outlined with red dots and that there's an arrow inside of this kidney pointing to a very bright object. And this is a patient who has developed a stone and the stone has become lodged in the collecting system which has led to the pain that the patient is feeling. And this is what is looked for when someone presents to tell us whether or not they either have a stone that's causing the problem, an infection, or bleeding, which look differently and are on the other two panels. But we're not going to focus too much on what's causing infection or bleeding, but it's really this brightness that shows up in part because of what's in the stone, such as calcium, that tells us that there is a stone causing the problem. So I'm going to hand over the next section of our presentation to Dr. Reddy, who's going to go through what it is clinically like to present with a kidney stone, uh, particularly if you have polycystic kidney disease. So Dr. Reddy? Hello, next slide. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for um, joining us. So now I'm going to talk about uh, the symptoms uh, with uh, kidney stones. So uh, few patients with kidney stones may not have any symptoms. Uh, we uh, find the stones incidentally in the CT scan that was done for other reasons. Uh, but most of the patients with kidney stones do develop symptoms, and if, when they do develop symptoms, the symptoms, uh, they can be very painful. Uh, you could have uh, severe back or side pain, and it can spread to the lower abdomen or the groin. So if you are looking at the picture, uh, that's where the pain usually starts, and then it can move down to the lower abdomen or the groin um, as the stone moves through the urinary tract. Now the pain can come in waves and fluctuates in intensity so there you could have some periods of pain, uh, severe intense pain followed by some periods of pain-free periods. So uh, it just uh, comes in waves. Now you, the patients can also see blood in the urine where you can see uh, uh, physical blood um, in the urine and then nausea or vomiting. Next slide. 
Now, as Dr. Chapman mentioned, uh, there are other causes of pain um, that we see in polycystic kidney disease that can mimic the pain uh, that occurs with uh, kidney stones. So the other causes of sudden intense pain uh, in polycystic kidney disease are uh, kidney infection or cyst infection. Now with kidney infection, you could again have severe side or back pain. Uh, it could be on one or both sides. And because of an infection, you could have high fever. Um, patients or you typically also have nausea and they um, have vomiting. And the urine could be very cloudy. And sometimes the urine uh, could have bad odor to it. And uh, the second cause of sudden pain is because of a cyst rupture or cyst hemorrhage or bleeding into the cyst. Again, when this happens, there is, again, there is sudden onset of pain, uh, but the pain here could be more localized to the area of the cyst that ruptured. And um, again, with the cyst rupture, you will see uh, blood in the urine. Now, the cyst rupture could happen either spontaneously or it could happen because of uh, some injury whether it's a fall or hit while playing uh, during contact sports. Uh, next slide. So uh, when patients typically come with sudden severe pain and we are trying to uh, differentiate between uh, the different causes of acute pain, uh, we do different tests. And one of the tests that we commonly do is urine analysis. Uh, urine analysis is um, uh, we take a patient's urine and test it under the microscope. And so we see, um, we can see blood in the urine on urine analysis. And we also sometimes um, are able to see crystals on the urinary sediment. And depending on uh, what kind of stone, we can see different crystals. And Dr. Zisman is going to talk about different types of crystals that we can uh, observe in the urine. And um, we can also say whether the urine is more acidic or alkaline. And because more acidic urine can predispose you to different types of stones, like uric acid stone, or when the, pH, when the pH of the urine is very high, it could signify an infection stone. Uh, so urine analysis can uh, give us some information. Now, urine, with urine analysis, we can also say whether the patient has a kidney infection uh, if we see some bacteria in the urine. Uh, now, to detect stones, as uh, Dr. Chapman mentioned, we need to really uh, do some sort of imaging study uh, to see whether there is a stone or not. Now, typically the imaging studies that we commonly do with um, when we suspect a stone is the ultrasound or the CT scan uh, without giving contrast. Uh, now, in general, CT scan is more sensitive than ultrasound in detecting stones, especially in patients with polycystic kidney disease because there are uh, large cysts that can block the view uh, of the collecting system. So we uh, routinely recommend CT scan uh, without contrast to uh, detect stones. Now, as you can see in this picture, this is a picture of one of my patients who uh, is a 28-year-old patient and you can see this, uh, I, I'm not sure whether you can see the arrows here, the arrows are pointing towards the two stones. So she actually uh, had these stones, we, she never had any symptoms, these are incidental stones uh, we found when we did the CT scan to investigate her polycystic kidney disease. So she had stones on both right and left kidney. And now I um, um, I'll have Dr. Zussman take over the presentation. Okay, you're hello, everybody. Uh, I have hello. You're good to go. Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. Good evening, and uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, next slide, please. So. Patients, as you heard from Dr. Chapman, uh, patients with PKD are more uh, at risk for kidney stones than somebody in the general population. 
Um, however, patients with BKD also can have some of the same risk factors as patients in the general population. So I wanted to start by reviewing you know, what an average person might be uh, doing in their life or have uh, as risk factors. So first of all, family history is a huge uh, contributor to kidney stone formation. Uh, things that can be inherited are a predisposition to uh, low urine citrate. Citrate actually helps prevent stones. So if you're predisposed to having a low urine citrate, you are at a greater risk for stone formation. Also, a high urine calcium, too much calcium uh, in the urine uh, can predispose you to calcium stones. Um, so obviously, you can't control your family. Uh, but as far as things that can be controlled, some risk factors are dietary uh, in nature, such as a high-protein diet or a high-sodium diet or a diet high in oxalate. Oxalate can be found in uh, things like nuts, uh, spinach, uh, green veg or a lot of the vegetables. Um, and there are various lists out there that delineate uh, foods high in oxalates. Other predisposing factors can be anatomic, so people uh, who have bladder problems and inability to empty their bladder, so uh, patients with spinal cord injury and the like, uh, or anything that makes the urine slow to flow through the kidney, so urinary stasis can contribute to risk of stones. Also abnormalities in the gastrointestinal tract, so anybody who's had bariatric surgery, uh, inflammatory bowel disease, those are additional risk factors for stone formation. Uh, urinary tract infections in the general population uh, also can contribute to stone disease. And other lifestyle factors, such as a job that requires uh, or doesn't allow you to go to the bathroom often. So I have a lot of patients with, who are surgeons or uh, kindergarten teachers who just cannot leave uh, their workplace, so they don't drink a lot, so they don't have to run to the bathroom. The picture on the left shows different places where stones can form and lodge. They can form anywhere within the kidney or the bladder, um, and they can certainly form in the kidney but lodge elsewhere. Uh, the picture on the or the kidney on the far left, uh, which is actually the right kidney, uh, shows a staghorn uh, stone, and a staghorn stone means that it's filling all of the little parts of the kidney that drain the urine. So basically the entire collecting system is filled with stone. A pelvic stone, uh, the picture on the right side or the left kidney, is uh, where the uh, ureter meets the kidney, and that's where a stone can become lodged. Uh, that's one of the sites that often causes the greatest pain. A calosteal stone is typically uh, the kind of stone that's asymptomatic, uh, so where it says calyx stone. Uh, those would be the ones that Dr. Reddy pointed out on the CT imaging. They're not obstructing, they're probably not causing pain, but they can be an itis for infection. Uh, the mid-ureteral stone is another place, so uh, the stone gets lodged in the ureter, uh, it can also cause a lot of pain. Uh, somehow it had made it already through the uh, first portion of the ureter, but now is stuck. And then ultimately, you can have bladder stones, so the stones have either formed in the bladder or passed through the kidney into the bladder uh, and are lodged there. Uh, typically, those do not cause pain, but are a great source uh, for infection to, uh, to grow. Next slide, please. So I mentioned the risk factors for stone formation in the general population, and anybody with PKD can be predisposed to those uh, risk factors just as anybody else. Unfortunately, on top of those risk factors, folks with uh, PKD have a few additional ones, and those are the ones list listed on the left side of the slide. So because the cysts can grow large, um, they can impinge on the, the drainage of the urine through the kidney. So as the cysts grow larger, you have more urinary stasis and decreased urine flow. And as I mentioned previously, decreased urine flow is a potential uh, source of uh, risk factors for stone formation. Um, you had heard from Dr. Reddy about infections uh, that can cause pain, but infections can also predispose to stone disease. Specific organisms can uh, make you more prone 
infections with specific organisms can make you more prone to stone formation uh, due to the high urine pH, uh, which is what Dr. Reddy had mentioned as being detected on the urinalysis. Now, low urine pH, uh, so on the other side of uh, the pH spectrum, can also contribute to stone disease. Uh, and that actually uh, can promote a different type of stone, that's your uric acid stone, which is the most common stone in PKD. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the three most common uh, stones in patients with PKD are listed uh, on the slides. So uh, in the general population, calcium stones are the most common. About 80% of stones are calcium. In the PKD population, it's actually the uric acid stone that's the most common. And that's the one on the right. Um, so when we look at a urine of a PKD patient, we can oftentimes detect these crystals in the urine, which can give us a hint of what may be happening. Now, just having those crystals does not uh, guarantee that the stone is made of the same thing, which is why it's always very important that if you ever pass a stone, that you actually collect the stone for analysis, um, whether yourself or your urologist. Uh, the struvite crystals on the bottom are the type of crystals associated with infection. If you see those, if your nephrologist sees those in the urine, those are pretty uh, pretty. We're pretty certain then that the stone is struvite and makes it much more important that we remove that stone. Next slide, please. So how does, you know, you're listening tonight, how do you determine what your risk of stone formation is? Or if you've already had a stone, what is the likelihood that you will have another one? And as in the general population, in patients with PKD, the risk is very individual. So the only way to really know is to evaluate your urine and to evaluate your imaging. So when I see a patient, I evaluate their previous CT or ultrasounds, and I look for the, uh, the stone burden as well as looking for the kidney volumes because we know that the larger the cysts, the larger the risk of stone formation. Every patient that has a kidney stone, uh, in order to evaluate risk, we need a 24-hour urine collection. The reason we need to be over 24 hours is that sometimes risk factors that you have in the morning are not the same risk factors that you have at night. So it helps us evaluate your overall um, risk throughout the course of the day. Now, in patients with polycystic kidney disease, the risk may actually be underestimated as it's very hard to measure the local effect of the pressure on the, uh, by the cyst, but it gives us some place to start with to um, appreciate where, what the risk is for recurrent stone formation. And as I mentioned previously, a stone analysis is crucial as it will tell me not only uh, what stone uh, you have there right now, but potentially what the other stones may be made of. Next slide, please. So let's say you already have a stone. What are the options? Now, if a, you are asymptomatic, in most cases, there is really little reason to do anything uh, unless there are recurrent infections, and that's something that you have to discuss with your urologist. Um, now, other options, if we know what kind of stone it is, specifically one that's associated with low urine pH, um, we can think about medication such as potassium citrate because what it does is it increases the urine pH and helps uh, prevent future stone formation as well as treat the current stone that you have. Uric acid stones are the only stones that could potentially be dissolved. The majority of treatment options, unfortunately, are surgical, and you see the three main uh, surgical approaches listed there. In modern times, we no longer uh, do open surgery for stone removal, but uh, in rare cases, that may also be necessary. Um, the three options, as in establishing risk, also in establishing treatment, are very individual. So depending on where the stone is, depending on what uh, the you know, what the relationship to the cysts and the overall health of the patient, the right treatment can be chosen. Ureteroscopy is where the urologist goes in through the urethra um, and goes up and actually gets the stone. Uh, 
the percutaneous nephrolithotomy requires a small hole in the back uh, through which the stone is retrieved. And the shockwave lithotripsy, um, or as well as some of you may have heard it referred to, uh, is where we use uh, ultrasound waves to break up the stone. And that's the image shown in the, cart uh, in the uh, corner. Um, one of the questions I frequently get is whether patients with polycystic kidney disease can undergo shockwave lithotripsy as there's concern for cyst rupture um, from the power of the uh, shockwave or bleeding into the cyst. Uh, the literature is actually does not uh, bear that out. It does not seem that the risk is greater in patients receiving lithotripsy uh, with PKD. However, the majority of uh, urologists in general would prefer to do ureteroscopy um, as it is a far uh, more certain way of getting the stone. Uh, so you don't, with shockwave lithotripsy, you may break up the stone and it may still not pass. Um, next slide. And that is it. And I will give it back to Alexis. All right, and for some reason, my screen, let me go back and pull that back up. Don't know why it just popped right off of there. If you have questions, please go ahead and oh, well, hang on. send them in to us uh, via these. Show that screen, show. There we go. All right. We're going to leave it like that so that we don't fuss with the technology and we just get to it. So we have um, several questions that have come in. Um, first of all, thank you so much to our panel for all of that wonderful information. So we had questions that were submitted before uh, beforehand that we'll start with. Someone is wondering if they can get kidney stones after they've had a transplant um, to for their PKD kidney. So if they, they're post-transplant, they have PKD, can they still get stones? Um, and Dr. Zussman, you are unmuted, and I'm going to go ahead and unmute Dr. Reddy as well. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure who best to take that one. Yeah, hi. Um, Alex, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so, you know, this is Dr. Chapman. Uh, I think maybe Dr. Reddy can answer that question. Okay. Dr. Muted. Yes. So, um, so if the patients have uh, had a transplant and they still have uh, their native kidneys and they still can develop kidney stones, um, but if they don't um, have their native kidneys, so that means their uh, uh, kidneys that they're born with, then the risk. Uh, can go down because they do not have any, um, uh, you know, they do not have the, the cysts in the kidney. Now, uh, Dr. Chapman, do you want to add to that? No, I, I think that's actually um, absolutely correct. So one of the things that happens when patients' native kidneys remain intact, as, as many of you may know, is that complications in those kidneys can continue to occur. Um, uh, the, the, there is oftentimes uh, a time when people will have painless blood show up in their urine, which could be of concern. Um, they could have the same types of symptoms that Dr. Reddy described, where one is having that colicky feeling where there is an obstructing stone somewhere in their, their urinary collecting system that causes pain to radiate. Um, or, you know, this could be something that had been present prior to the transplant taking place where the stone is actually now moved into a position that's causing discomfort. Um, but with the kidneys removed, uh, transplant in and of itself um, is potentially linked to developing a kidney stone and um, depending on the risk factors surrounding that particular individual, as well as what happens to their own diet after they've had a transplant, as well as how well the transplant functions, can also contribute to new stone formation 
and obviously Dr. Zisman can also chime in, uh, who has a lot of experience taking care of many different types of patients with kidney stones. Yeah, no, so I think all the key points have been mentioned. The transplant itself can predispose to stone formation due to some of the medications and uh, a predisposition to low citrates, and then um, there are other issues that can contribute to formation in the transplant kidney, which are not cyst-related. Um, the typically with advancing kidney disease, the uh, clearance through the uh, native kidneys is significantly decreased. So we typically don't see a new stone formation unless it's infection related, but it doesn't mean that the stones that were there in the past can't pass um, and cause the symptoms that have been described. Okay, great, thank you. Um, we have had a request to show the pictures of the different kinds of stones again, mm -hmm. so I'm just going to do that. Um, and while I flash that up there, we have another unrelated question, but I'm just going to leave that up there for a few minutes for the person that was asking for that. Um, one question that we received... Well, Alex, did they want to have someone just talk about what the different crystals represented? Is that what they wanted? or? You know, that's, they. I asked and they said no, but why don't you go ahead and run through that one more time just because um, I don't think it will take very long and I think it's always good to have that, especially for the replay um, and post it on the website. So if you don't mind running through that just quickly again, that would be great. Okay. Um, Dr. Zisman, do you want to do that? Yeah, so the one thing that I would like to clarify is that these are crystals. So these are not stones. These are the precursors to stones. So a stone is a collection of um, a lot, a lot, a lot of crystals. So actually, if you look at uh, the average person's urine, a lot of people have calcium oxalate crystals. Uh, so just having those crystals in the urine does not signify having a calcium oxalate stone. Um, that said, if it may give us a hint to what that particular person may be at risk for. So the three main stone types in uh, ADPKD are in order of frequency the uric acid stones, and that's because of the low urine pH. So one question that also often comes up is, you know, is this like gout? Is this because of I'm eating too much meat? Uh, things like that. And actually in um, most patients with PKD, this is not the reason. It is not uh, dietary. It is mostly due to the low urine pH, and that low urine pH is linked to that uh, abnormality of uh, being able to concentrate that happens early on, uh, which you saw in Dr. Chapman's slide. Uh, and because of that, the urine pH, so the urine is very acidic, and that predisposes to uric acid formation, both crystal and then ultimately stone formation. Stones can also be mixed, so stones can be can have all three of those crystals, but we often go by what is the most predominant uh, stone type. So if somebody has a stone and 70% calcium oxalate, 20% uh, uric acid, uh, and some protein, we'll call it a calcium oxalate stone. Uh, and then the bottom part, the struvite, uh, that's a different name for uh, a triple phosphate, magnesium triple phosphate uh, stone. And that's the stone that you only see in infection. So uh, the pH has to be very, very high. And typically, uh, the human kidney cannot make the pH that high. And so it requires an organism that is able to do it. So things like Proteus uh, is an infectious organism that's associated with uh, struvite stone formation. Um, struvite stones are unique in that um, they can grow very quickly. and Typically, in order to prevent um, faster growth, uh, you need to remove that stone. Okay, great. Does that clarify? Yes, that's that's perfect. Um, and I, so I'm getting several questions here. I'm going to go ahead and leave it on this slide. But if if at any point you want me to move to a different slide, um, just let me know. But we have several questions about stones and cysts and kind of how they interact. So. Um, one of the first things we're wondering is, is it possible for stones to get caught inside a cyst? Yeah, so maybe I can help with this one, and obviously Dr. Reddy or, or Dr. Zispin can chime in. You know, it's often not easy to differentiate a stone from what we call a cyst wall calci calcification, um, because um, one of the things we look for on... Um, 
our um, imaging, particularly CT imaging, which is used the most often when we are we're suspicious that there's a stone in place, is that calcification is what is that bright, bright uh, spot that shows up on the image. It was shown on the the um, pictures that uh, Dr. Reddy showed, and if you want to put that up there, you can you can show that the cyst wall calcifications. Um, Which one? Mine, this, it's usually because yes, there's been bleeding fine. into that cavity and the blood has remained after the bleeding has stopped and calcium has actually come into the space as well and tends to attach to the, the lining of the cyst wall uh, and create a calcification. That typically doesn't become a problem as far as a stone would be concerned. Uh, in ADPKD, and it rarely uh, leaves the kidney. Um, it's important to note that although we've talked a lot about calcifications, when you look at the types of stones that PKD patients develop, um, the distribution is a little different than stones in the general population. So we probably see, and this is where Dr. Zisman can correct me if I'm wrong, more uh, calcium-based stones in the general population, whereas in the PKD population there tends to be more of a representation of the uric acid based stones as well as the struvite stones. Um, and that links in part to what she had described as this lack of citrate in the urine uh, as well as uh, the potential for a low flow state when cysts get very large and uh, change the shape of the collecting system where urine forms. So uh, all stones are possible in uh, PKD um, and it's not necessarily that uric acid stones are the most common, but they're more common than you would see in the general population. Uh, and when we get uric acid stones, if they really are just uric acid, you can't see that bright light that you see uh, on CT scan when there's calcium in the stone. Okay, fantastic. Um, and you may have kind of already answered this, but just to be um, clear, so to, if, you, if you do get stone fragments inside the cyst, which I think you're saying is really not very possible, um, well, you know, if that happens, will they stay put and caught and just be sort of there, or is that an issue? Right. So, so the so they're not stone fragments so much. So they didn't start like a, a crystal and then grow and tag on more crystals and aggregate and then solidify into a stone. The calcification that you typically see inside a cyst is really after a bleeding episode. And when blood comes into the uh, cyst space, comes along with it, is calcium. And that calcium will attach itself to the wall of the cyst. It's not the same thing as having a stone. Now, you know, independent of the fact that that calcium is present, some cysts actually rupture. And um, if they rupture where they can actually um, um, be dumped into the collecting system, that's when patients will actually see blood in their urine. A lot of times patients will have um, a cyst bleed but it doesn't have that space to escape into. And that's actually a more painful situation than when the content of the cyst end up in the urinary space. And the pain in that situation is really because the bleeding has nowhere to go and it's expanding quite quickly and kidneys don't, it's very uncomfortable when that happens inside a kidney. So um, if someone had a calcified um, cyst with blood in it that happened to rupture into a urinary space, it's unlikely that the calcium that was along the wall of that cyst would go with the blood into the urinary space. It would probably stay behind in the kidney because it's still attached to the wall of the cyst. Okay, great. Um, okay, kind of along the same line, um, we have a couple of questions about sort of dietary things and what is, is there a risk? So one person's wondering, is there a risk for ADPKD patients to take potassium bicarbonate? Um, Dr. Reddy, do you want to take that one? What was the question again, Alexis, again? Potassium 
Is there a risk for ADPKD patients to take potassium bicarbonate? So, um, so usually uh, for stone patients, if um, because the citrate is low, we um, the uh, we recommend potassium citrate uh, to prevent stone formation. Um, we uh, do not believe. I mean, we do not recommend sodium uh, potassium bicarbonate. We can, the patients can take potassium bicarbonate. There is no uh, increased risk uh, for stone formation. Um, but we p routinely recommend potassium citrate. Again, uh, Anna, uh, Dr. Zisman, uh, do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, so actually when uh, there's no risk uh, at all, the main uh, is just a matter of side effects and uh, taking the bicarbonate it tends to give people more GI upset. But actually whether you take, uh, even if you take potassium citrate, it's metabolized uh, by the liver uh, into bicarbonate. So the kidney actually sees it the same way. Uh, the citrate that ends up in the urine is not the citrate that you take. It's a different way in which the kidney handles its stimulus for citrate, um, taking back citrate. So it's a long way of saying, it. no, there's no, it's not unsafe, it's very safe, it's just a matter, and it will work the same way as far as raising the urine citrate. Okay, great. Um, a, a, a few more uh, questions are coming in about diet. So one person is asking, is there anything that that they should avoid or particularly um, move towards as far as diet goes to prevent crystals from forming um, other than drinking a lot of water? Is there anything else that our patients can do as far as diet is concerned? Well, maybe I can start, but I think Dr. Zisman should end the, the, the part answering this question. And so, you know, and the, the drop at the end of that question was other than drinking a lot of water, and I can't emphasize enough how important that is for almost any kind of stone that a PKD patient is going to develop. Um, you know, obviously the infection-related stones really have to be addressed quite differently. But for all the other types of stones, number one, number two, and number three is drinking enough liquids. And that really is a very specific amount. It's, it's not a certain amount one day and a certain amount the next. It's really trying to get uh, urine volumes or fluid intake up to at least three liters a day. Um, and in, for some reason, which I think is, is a very interesting curiosity, it's not easy for people to drink that much every day. Um, it takes a bit of a reminder, um, a, a, a cherished water bottle <laughs> with um, your favorite logo so you don't want to lose it, and uh, a place where you can carry it easily where it doesn't cause any kind of staining in your purse or backpack or, or uh, however you carry your things around. But um, I can't emphasize enough how important fluid intake is for this type of complication in PKD. And then I'll, I'll let uh, Dr. Zussman talk about the different diets that might be important. So I cannot echo that enough. Uh, the, the most important by far uh, dietary or lifestyle factor is going to be fluid intake, and water is the best fluid. Um, other than that, uh, generally, you know, good rule for any stone type, PKD or not, is low sodium or normal sodium diets. So that's 2,300 milligrams uh, per day, no more than 2,300 milligrams of sodium per day. Now, the oxalate is the other one that if people Google uh, online, they find a low oxalate diet being important. Um, the truth is, is the oxalate in some people is a very uh, big contributor, and others it's not, and it has to do with um, how your gut handles uh, oxalate absorption, um, which is why we actually recommend that everybody have a 24-hour urine collection uh, done, at least one or two. Um, the, if your urine oxalate is normal, uh, having a urine uh, or a low oxalate diet is uh, just cruel. Um, and you can focus those efforts on increasing fluid intake. And there were some questions, um, I think, in the 
uh, that were, had been emailed beforehand and somebody had asked about uh, various spices. So those spices have a variety of different spices have been associated with increased oxalates uh, excretions. So I definitely would not um, recommend those. But turmeric was the, the one asked. So you would specifically not recommend turmeric as um, having any beneficial effect on stones or for a PKD patient? Uh, no, uh, actually having a harmful effect by increasing urine oxalate. Okay, fantastic. Um, and then we've had kind of a, a, another question along these lines. Someone has been told to avoid black tea to prevent cyst formation or stone formation. I apologize. Um, and they're wondering if this is true, and if it is true, why so? The I guess I'll take that one. The the thought is because of oxalates, so tea can be high in oxalate depending on the tea. Um, and again, that that goes back to if you're you need to know where the urine oxalate is. And if it is normal, then um, generally not a problem. In general, as with all um, stones, moderation is a good um, rule of thumb. So drinking a cup of tea is never going to cause stone formation. It's drinking eight cups of tea. Um, and the only thing we advocate not having moderation in it is water intake. OK. Um, and then someone is saying, can you? Just explain a bit, like, what you mean by low oxalate diet. Um, and I know you've kind of explained that, but maybe sort of state that again for clarity. So um, just to reiterate, I in general, this is individualized, so I'm not suggesting a low oxalate diet for everybody. In some people who have a high urine oxalate uh, level, which can only be determined by testing, uh, we do recommend a lower oxalate diet, and that would largely mean avoiding uh, things like almonds, most nuts, uh, spinach is a big one, uh, rhubarb, uh, things like that. So just to reiterate, um, if you are considering a low oxalate diet, you'll want to do that in consultation with your personal physician, um, nephrologist, urologist, someone that you are seeing who knows your situation specifically. Um, this is certainly not a recommendation as a, a blanket recommendation for everyone on the webinar. Um, okay, we have a few more questions in just about five more minutes, so I think we can get to two more. And if we don't get to your questions tonight, I will work with our panel to see if we can't get some answers out to everyone um, after the fact. But uh, one question, what is the difference between a UTI and a kidney infection? Dr. Reddy, do you want to take that one? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, um, so UTI, or it is also called urinary tract infection. And so the urinary tract infection, the infection can occur anywhere from the kidney uh, to the bladder infection. So when we talk about kidney infection, we, uh, we generally mean the kidneys um, are infected. Now, when we talk about UTI, we can either mean bladder infection or the kidney infection. So the bladder infection is, uh, when you have the infection of the bladder, the infection is, uh, has not spread to the kidney. Um, but um, some uh, patients and use kidney infection and UTI interchangeably, um, but there are two distinct um, features. So when you have a kidney infection where the kidneys are actually infected, you could have pain uh, on your side or your back um, and um, receive your pain on your side or your back. Whereas in a bladder infection, you might not have that pain, whereas um, you will feel that you have more pressure when you uh, want to go to the bathroom or you have pain when you uh, try to uh, uh, go to the bathroom and um, some pain um, in your uh, abdomen um, just above the pelvis um, but not typically the side pain. So we tend to differentiate the urinary tract infection into either a bladder infection or the infection of the kidneys. Uh, does that answer the question? I believe so and I haven't gotten any follow-up. So I think that's good on that one. Um, and then I think we do have time for one more question. 
Um, someone is wondering if the location of the stone in the kidney will determine if it can pass on its own. Yeah, I, you know, I can start, but I think truly Dr. Zisman has to finish on this because she takes care of these kinds of complications all the time. And, you know, I think there are two things that determine whether a stone can pass. One is the size, and a, 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 after a certain size is reached, you can see from that picture that showed if you have a stone either in the collecting system or in the ureter or down in the bladder, um, those are narrowings, and they can um, expand to a certain degree, but really um, there is an upper limit as to how much the opening into the bladder can open and how much the ureter can open. So um, certainly it would be nice for stones to pass on their own, but sometimes just related to their size, um, it's not possible for them to do so. Um, there may be other factors besides size, but that, that is the main one. And uh, maybe you did. can um, follow up with that. Yeah, absolutely. So the, as you, Dr. Chapman mentioned, the uh, size is the biggest predictor. But uh, unless they're real, so above about a centimeter, they're definitely not going to pass uh, for any, in anybody. But below a centimeter, it varies a lot. So some people can pass, you know, nine millimeter or a centimeter uh, size stone, and actually, the more stones you've passed, the more likely you are to have passed. Um, more after pregnancy, women tend to have a uh, easier time passing uh, stones uh, due to the uh, hormonal changes. But honestly, as with everything else in stone disease, it's very individual. And while some locations are, you know, there's some calyces that are harder to get to and therefore to get the stone out of um, where they can get stuck. Generally, it's um, size and a little bit of luck. Unmuted. Okay. Um, well, I think that is all the time we have for tonight. So the first thing I want to do is just thank our panel so much for the time that you've given us this evening and all of the wonderful information um, you've relayed. I know that you all have very busy schedules, and so everyone here, and I've gotten several thank you messages um, as well as your email in the chat box just to say what a wonderful uh, presentation this has been. So thank you so much for that. Um, I will also thank the audience for participating in the webinar. You all submitted some great questions during the presentation and after. Um, and so your participation just makes it a more robust conversation and I do appreciate that. Um, we will be recording, or we have been recording this webinar and so we'll be posting it on our website. Um, and along with all of the previous webinars that we have recorded and posted there. So it's on the website in the Learn section under webinars. Um, and if you have any trouble finding that, um, it should be up in about a week or so. You can always email me at education at pkdcure.org for help finding that recording. Um, and finally, the, the PKD Foundation appreciates the opportunity to provide you with the best possible education. Um, I will email out a quick survey to everyone in the next few days who's registered and attended this uh, presentation. And I really do appreciate your feedback and look at your responses and use them to develop resources and programs in the future. Um, if you complete that survey and you have ideas of additional topics that you would like to be covered in future webinars and education offerings, please include that. There's a space for that. I'm always looking for your ideas and what you're looking for in a webinar. Um, if you need anything from us at the foundation, you can reach out directly at education at pkdcure.org. Um, and a member of the education team will get back to you soon. Um, and on behalf of everyone, we wish you a lovely evening.